It's the 10% Happier Podcast. I'm your host, your boy, Dan Harris. Hello, everybody. Today, we've got a wide-ranging interview with Zach Braff. He's one of those rare, famous people who's really willing to go there. We talk about a lot of stuff here, anxiety, depression, insomnia, addiction, grief, social media usage, and what he means by these phrases, learning to love your likes and learning to love your fate. That second notion uh, he feels so strongly about that he literally tattooed it on his wrist. You may know Zach from the TV show Scrubs or the movie Garden State, but this dude is a genuine multi-hyphenate. He's a true triple threat. He acts, writes, and directs, and that includes his own movies and other people's stuff. He's actually directed on Ted Lasso over on Apple TV+. Plus. I know a lot of people who listen to this show love that show. Relatively recently, Zach put out another of his own movies, which he wrote and directed. It's called A Good Person. And it stars Florence Pugh and Morgan Freeman and has a lot of resonant themes for this show and this audience. So we talk about that movie a little bit, among many other things. We conducted this interview in person at the TED conference in Vancouver a few months back. Always cool to do interviews in person. Just to say, and this is important, at least to me, I've mentioned this before, I think, but we're starting to experiment with some new formats on Fridays. Historically, as many of you know, we've posted full interviews on Mondays and Wednesdays and then bonus meditations on Friday. But now we're going to start posting some regular episodes on Fridays as well. And if you could do me a solid, we could use some feedback on this. Do you actually want us to do three episodes a week? Will you listen? We actually have tons of material and a ton of other people that we'd like to interview and put on the show. However, I do not want to turn this show into the audio version of Spam, so please hit me up on Twitter or send me a note through 10percent.com. Let me know if three is a crowd. Isn't that that, that the expression? Two's company, three's a crowd? Anyway, yeah, give me feedback, please. Happier. Zach Braff, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dan, for having me. Nice to see you. Congratulations on the new movie. Thank you. It was really fun to watch. Yeah. Well, I don't want to say it was fun to watch. Well, I don't know if fun is the word. I it's mean, there the right is word. humor, of course. Definitely. It, but I hope that it's a moving experience. Was it a moving Definitely. experience? Definitely. All right, good. I'm going to ask you a question. This is a bit of a potentially embarrassing gambit. You can ask a, me anything, Dan. It, I just a, will say pass <laughs> if I don't want to answer you, it. F- fine. <laughs> fine. Uh, That's what I always tell... Journalist, I know you're a bit of a hybrid, but what I always tell journalists, you can ask me anything. I might just say pass. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is personal. Or, well, maybe it is. Uh, my worry is it's a little on the nose. Go ahead. The name of the movie is A Good Person. This is something I've asked myself a lot. Am I a good person? I'm just curious, do you ask yourself that, and where do you net out on whether you're a good person? I don't know, and I really don't. I don't even attempt to answer that for people. I hope, of course, amongst the conversations that people have with their friends and loved ones after they see the film, that that might come up. I will just say that when tragedy has struck me and when I've seen it strike loved ones, that there is an initial response of, why me? I'm a good person. Why did this happen to me? And um, I lost my sister to an aneurysm. She survived two years as a fraction of herself before she passed. And I'm looking at my mom deal with this horrific thing that has happened and be by her bedside every day. And one can't help but say to the universe, why my mom? She's a saint. She's the nicest person I've ever met. She's such a good person. Why did this befall her? Uh, My friend Amanda Klutz lost my best friend uh, Nick Cordero to covid Amanda Klutz, if anyone who's ever met her or sees her on, she's on the talk as a, as a host. She's a saint. She's literally an angel. She's actually a religious person. So on top of being a saint in real life, she's also a religious person. Why her? And so I think that's probably one of the sources of the title of the film is that human inclination, I believe, to cry out either silently or in real life, why me? I'm a good person. 
do you think there's any order in the universe? No, I don't have any answers for that. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's just the, that's what the poem's about, you know. If you if you can call it a poem, when you say poem, what well, are you I just mean to? I just mean film. That's what the piece of art is ruminating on: is how we move on, how how these things befall all of us human beings at obviously relative scales of tragedy. In the film, it's not a secret; it's in the trailer. It's vehicular manslaughter that happens to this family. But I hope that people see in themselves their own struggles, their own grief that they've dealt with in their life and can experience it, but also see that there's hope in the film. That's what I meant to get across. I guess what I was driving at is it's very common, as you said, for people to say, why me when something bad happens to them? I remember in high school, there was this really cool kid, John Spagnolo, who was a friend of mine. And I always, I thought he was the coolest guy. And one day he ripped his shirt and he's like, why does this always happen to me? And I was like, oh, well, he feels like that. <laughs> um, this is a common refrain for us. And yet I had a guest on a couple of years ago. I can't remember who it was. But she said, when bad shit happens to her, she's like, why not me? I guess it must be my turn. That feels like the more rational response. I don't know that I could muster it. I don't know that I could muster it, but it's it's this very healthy way. I knew this old cast director who just passed away in New York, Jay Bender, used to say, I, in a very heavy Jewish New York accent, he said, I used to, I just expect that anything that could possibly go wrong will go wrong. And that way, if anything good happens, it's a mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> that's another way to go about it. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I mean, that's a kind of defensive pessimism yeah. that I, is, a, is sort of like a backdoor manifestation. Yeah. But this is different. I mean, it's like you get the cancer diagnosis and instead of saying, why me, I'm a good person, you're like, all right, well, cancer happens. I'm a person. Yeah. So the some odds it's going to happen to me. Yeah. I hear that. I don't know that I would have the strength of mind to say that if and when it happened to me. I think I would fall into the category of people say, you know, what the fuck? I'm, I live a healthy life. I, I'm kind. I try to be the best person I can. Well, which, of course, makes no sense in the, in the order of the universe. It's just a, it just feels like a human impulse. You know, I know that I've sometimes had this inner dialogue of, well, you're actually a piece of shit. Not about you, about me. About me. Well, about you too. <laughs> about me, Dan Yeah, Harris. you're the worst. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, is that a, a thing you wrestle with at all? or Because you, you sidestep the question. You didn't say pass, but you you didn't take that part of the question I aspire to be a good person. I'm not passing on that. No, but I think we all fall down. We all have to make amends for times when we were a piece of shit. That's just being a human being. But certainly, I aspire to learn. I aspire to be better. I aspire to make amends for places where I've fucked up. I mean, we're at the TED conference. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't trying to learn and grow and be a better human being for however many years I have left here. I'm going to reframe my attendance at TED as part of me being a good person. I like that. Well, no, I just think that if you're here, if you're lucky enough to be here, why are you here? One is here because there's an opportunity to learn. Yes. There's an opportunity to say, I don't know anything about most of these topics and I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to be educated and and then hopefully bring that back to my community, whether it's my personal community or my fan community or the work that I do and spread positive information. Yeah. It's amazing that way. It really is. I mean, just the first night last night was just fascinating. You listed a series of cataclysms that befell you and the family over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Your sister, your dad passed away. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you mentioned that, but your dad also passed away. Lost and then, my dad, yeah. And, and then, then your friend Nick. Then my friend Nick to COVID. And then even after I wrote the film, my manager, Chris Yvain, to depression and to, who took his own life. All of that's happened in since 2018. That's a lot. And I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm curious how that parade of horribles resulted in writing this movie, what was the causal link? Um, I, I find writing very hard solely because, you know, staring at the blank cursor and finding anything to do, but actually write is easier than writing. But during lockdown, I felt like I was out of excuses and I had, felt like I did have something to say. I didn't know quite what it was. I wanted to write something about these feelings. I didn't know what the story that would come out of them. I didn't want to tell my specific stories, but I wanted to write about grief. I wanted to write about standing back up. I wanted to write about hope. You know, when my work has resonated before, I tapped into a specificity of feelings and emotions I was having myself, but other people found a way in and saw themselves in it. So I thought if I went back and wrote something very, very authentic to myself, there would likely be people that would respond to it like they did to my first film, Garden State. 
I was also dating Florence Pugh at the time. We did Lockdown together, and I'm just in awe of her as an actress. So I always knew I was going to write it for her. I was never planning to be in it myself. I was writing it with her as the protagonist. So it was that emotional state. I mean, Nick and his wife, I have a small guest house behind my home, and they were literally living in my home during lockdown when he got COVID and was admitted to Cedar sinai um, and slowly died. So that we were at a front row for that and helping to take care of Amanda and her child. So it was in that headspace that I wrote the film A Good Person. So you didn't want to tell the story on the nose of what had happened to you, but you wanted to take those emotions, yeah. funnel it into a leading lady who happened to be living with at the time. Yeah. And the story of a good person is what came out. Absolutely. That's well said. That's better said than I said it. <laughs> you must be a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> um, addiction is a huge part of this movie. Is that something you've dealt with? Not in a attending a program sort of way myself, but I'm definitely exploring my own relationship to alcohol and consumption on my own. There's this whole movement called Sober Curious. Yeah, uh, yeah. I definitely feel part of the Sober Curious community and trying out life without booze. I've been lucky so far that I haven't needed to uh, program, but wouldn't hesitate for a second if I felt I did. But I've had many loved ones battle it, and I've been very moved by the opioid crisis. It's always been something that really bothered me, and then I read the book Dope Sick, and that just made me livid. Anyone who reads the book will, I think, feel the same way. It's brilliantly written, and the quicker ways, of course, watch the series, which was very well done. But so I guess my feelings about um, addiction and my feelings about Big Pharma and what has befallen our country was also on my mind when I was writing. So you're not drinking right I'm now? I'm currently not drinking at all, no. How long? It's about to be three months. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's something. I don't want to broadcast that I'm necessarily sober for life, but I am sober curious and trying it and feeling pretty darn great. That was just what I was going to ask. It's showing up in like your mood. Oh, on- absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great experiment. I don't know if you ever listened to the Rich Roll podcast, yes, but he's, yes, he's just yes. really become a... <laughs> I don't know. I call him my rabbi, but I just find him so helpful. I encourage when you're not listening to Dan's podcast <laughs> and when you're not listening to my bad podcast, Fake Doctors, Real Friends, there's a plug. Um, Rich is just an incredible, inspiring guy. And he's a guy who did have a huge addiction problem and tackled it and then became one of the most major marathoners on the planet. And, and, and he, not at a young age, in his 40s. Yeah, he's yeah. just such yeah. an inspiration. I jokingly call him my rabbi because there's so much I've learned from his podcast. He has these wonderful guests on, and then I buy their book or I go to their website and I learn so much more. And he actually sent me a link to a guy who started a movement called One Year No Beer that was really targeting that subset of humans that – might not necessarily need a a program like AA or inpatient or any kind of recovery, but could possibly potentially do it on their own, but are kind of curious. And he framed it as a challenge on his website. So you could do 30-day challenge, a three-month challenge. And he even says that it it helps in your social circles when people are pressuring you to, oh, come on. And and when you frame it like, oh, no, I'm doing this challenge, people would lean in and they're like, really? What's the challenge? Yes, yes, yes. So... I don't mean to say that I'm doing that in particular, but I responded to what this guy was saying about looking at one's relationship to alcohol and how I might be able to lead a better life without it. Why do you think life would be better? What were the downsides to drinking? Well, you know, I'm 48 now, and I really began to notice that even casual drinking made me feel a lot more tired and a lot more depressed, anxious. I think they're feelings I had most of my life, but they get magnified every year. So just in doing a a little experiment with playing with the idea of doing a month sober, and then you start to feel benefits and you go, oh, shit, let me try two months. And then you do two months and you feel better and lighter and healthier. And then you try three months. And anyone, and talk to any sober person, it'll tell you, oh, just wait till six months. Mm. And that coupled with working out, and I just think it's been really good for my mental health. Now, again, I don't want a, someone to come up to me in a bar and go, hey, you said you weren't drinking. I don't know that this is for life, but it's something I'm certainly intrigued by and um, enjoying. It could just be part of a recalibration that leads to a different relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I got to tell you, I do have to say that if anyone's curious, sober curious, try it for a month. It's without a doubt noticeable for me. I don't want to downplay how hard it is just in little ways. I stopped drinking not because I ever had a problem with alcohol. I don't, although there's a lot of alcoholism in my family. So what I'm about to say might have been a blessing. But in my late 30s, so back in the steam era. In the 60s. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 
in my late 30s, I just developed an intolerance for it. It makes me sick. I have a question for you. Am I allowed to ask questions? Of course. You recalibrated your life in a huge way. I read your book. Yeah, well, I stopped doing cocaine, but that was a different thing. Okay, but in addition to stopping just doing cocaine and finding meditation as a way to totally transform your whole life, did you also cut back on alcohol or no. did you just keep drinking? I kept drinking, but I was never a huge drinker, so it was not impacting my life. Mm. Cocaine was impacting my life in that it gave me a panic attack. And also, would I be a mess the next day? Because mm. I wasn't, I don't know if anybody can moderately use cocaine, but I certainly was not yeah. using it moderately when I did it on those occasions. But a couple of years after that, so that happened, the panic attack happened when I was like 34, 35. Around 38, 39, any time I would have a sip of alcohol, no matter what kind, I would feel bad. So I just cut it out. Yeah. What I was saying is that even to this day, so it's been... 13, 14 years where I just don't drink. If I'm out to lunch with a bunch of buddies and they're having a nice bottle of wine, or if I'm at a cocktail party and people are handing out drinks, I really want it. It's not like I want to get hammered, but it's fun to drink with others. I'm saying all of this to go back to my comment about three months for you. It is no small deal. Three months is no, it isn't in because, that context. Because, because you know, I, I said to my friend, you know, we're at the TED conference. For me to get from the TED conference to my hotel room, I probably passed 10 bars yeah. last night. Yeah, literally, because if you're not here at the conference, when the events are over, there's bars everywhere at the convention center and then in your hotel. And, but I really am having fun with it. I'm treating it like a bit of a game, like the challenge. I'm not doing this gentleman's challenge, but I feel like I'm doing a challenge. And my therapist always says there's such power in a streak. Yes. And I definitely feel the power and fun of the streak. And I'm like, I'm not fucking up my streak. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> You mentioned before anxiety and depression. Yeah. I know you have some clinical history with that yeah. and with OCD as well. Yeah. And panic attacks, which, have you only had one, the one panic no, attack? No, I'm pretty good at it. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to brag, I know that you have. I know that it. you have the one that you was broadcast yes. and changed your life. Yes. There have been plenty of them that have not been broadcast and also diminished my life. That's funny. I've been, I've been excited to talk to you because I had been meditating for a while now. And I said, you know, when I see Dan Harris, I'm going to tell him that, you know, when I do it regularly, it's more than 10%. And I'm Definitely. sure that you've heard that from people. Yes, yes. But I've been waiting for you to tell you that. But I think you're underselling meditation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my little shtick on this is that no, I it, forgot. The, the 10% compounds annually. It's oh, I didn't, like I any good that. investment. You know, the, the 10% is a joke anyway. I'm trying to counter-program against the over-promising of many people. In the, no, I think that's smart. Of this self But I, I found there's moments when I'm in a good streak with it, and I'm doing it regularly, and I feel really good. Yes. And I'm like, I want to tell Dan Harris that 10% <laughs> is underselling. <laughs> then I've done my job. I've done my job. I, I'd rather have people have upside. But it sounds like you get on streaks and then I do. I do. Bit. I have to say, with meditation, I do fall off the wagon sometimes. It has to do with finding the time or getting up early. Like, for example, here, I didn't meditate today. I wish I had. I got up early to have breakfast and then get here in time and grab a coffee with a friend and I didn't do it today. And I find it compounds over the course of a week. Yes. So if by Friday you didn't meditate at all, I notice it more than if I miss a day or two. Absolutely. How long do you do your sessions? I forgot. On a good day. You know, like I, I skipped the morning here at TED and, and oh. stayed in my room because I, I, this is not interesting, but the last couple of weeks I've been out and about traveling with my family and then I got sick and I haven't been able to do some of the basics of self-care right. that I wanted to do. So this morning I was like, look, I'm going to get up, I'm going to meditate for 45 minutes, I'm going to swim, I'm going to stretch, and then I'm going to show up at the conference when Correct. I fucking want to show up at the conference. Great. So you do a 45-minute morning meditation? Yeah. And then I'll do some throughout the rest of the day here and there, uh, usually a little bit of walking meditation before I go to bed. Mm -hmm. I find walking meditation right before bed gets the spielkes out, the mm -hmm. ants in the pants. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I try to shoot for about an hour a day in mm -hmm. chunks. Yeah. Which, by the way, is not just for anybody who's listening and worried that like, well, I can't be a meditator if I'm not doing no, Dan Harris's no. hour. Like, I think one minute counts. And oh, absolutely. Short I mean, doses are do, fine. Do what, if you're curious about this, and I really learned it from Dan's book. You were, the, you were my, really, truly, this is not uh, bullshit. Your book was my first introduction into the idea that it could be helpful for anxiety and panic. And it really has been. I aspire to be more diligent about it than I currently am, but I notice it. And it, like, if you're listening and curious uh, 
and obviously you know about this if you're listening to Dan's podcast, but yeah, I mean, it's better to do five minutes than do zero minutes. Yes. Can I make you feel better about the, or at least try to make you feel better about the uh, alleged by you lack of diligence about meditation? Yes, please. I think it is very normal from what we know about habit formation and behavior change to have streaks and that streaks that end. And I actually think there can be real benefit to quote unquote falling off the wagon. Part of it is that, and I hear this in some of your comments, that you can start to see what an asshole you are to yourself more clearly when you haven't meditated. Mm -hmm. And that can be a powerful incentive to get back on the wagon. And so I wouldn't waste those lapses. I wouldn't waste the ends of these streaks. There can be really powerful learning experience. It's definitely, without a doubt, in my mind, noticeable when I take even a small amount of time each morning and do it. Yes. What's important for you in terms of managing things like anxiety, depression? I know OCD was more of an issue when you were a kid. Yeah. But- I, you know, OCD in terms of tapping and, and stuff like that was a childhood problem. But as an adult... Meaning compulsive tapping. Yeah, compulsive yeah. tapping. Your listeners may have seen stories on television, but as a child, an example I give is I had a teddy bear and I would think... I need to kiss the teddy bear six times before I leave my bedroom or something bad is going to happen to my mm-hmm. family. Mm-hmm. And then even as a little boy, I remember thinking, well, that doesn't make any sense. And I don't think it's real. But just to be safe, I don't want anything to happen to my family. So I'm going to do it for the family. And it was like a superstition. My mom's a psychologist. So she knew what these signs were. And I saw a therapist and he diagnosed it as OCD. And I eventually grew out of the tapping stuff. I never had that problem as an adult, but I'll see it still at 48, um, a little whisper in my brain going, you know, you should straighten that or or it'll be sort of bad luck for the day. Hmm. That's how it manifests in my head hmm. now. And then I have the ability to go, oh, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm not fixing that corner of that magazine. But I hear it. I do hear it. How skillful are you at saying shut the fuck up to anxiety and depression? Um, I need tools for that. My therapist jokingly says, going to the gym will put me out of business meaning putting him out of business. So I do find that working out definitely helps. I need that. Meditation helps. Not drinking helps. Sleep, important, very important for me. Laughter, those are some of the things. I mean, that's... The sun. I definitely need yes. the sun. I love Vancouver. Thank you for having me, Vancouver. I can't <laughs> live here. <laughs> I definitely am. I notice that I mentally feel healthier in the sunny environment. Coming up, Zach Braff talks about the significance of the tattoo he has on his wrist, how he deals with insomnia, and the pros and cons of social media. Experiences are what people love the most about travel. That is why I love, I really do love, Viator. They have Over 300,000 bookable experiences and something for everybody, from walking tours to extreme adventures. Plus, Viator's travel experiences have millions of real traveler reviews, so you have the information you need to book the best activities for your trip and your people. I uh, mentioned this before, but I went on a big cross-country trip with my son recently. We were in Vegas and New Orleans and uh, Jackson Hole, and I used Viator to scan through some possible activities we could do in each of these places. We've got some more trips coming up. Uh, We're going to LA, and I plan to use Viator uh, to find us some cool things to do in that time. It's actually a great way for Alexander and I to mutually get excited about the trip, and uh, with summer upon us, actually, when many of us taking trips, uh, now might be the right time for you to check out Viator yourself. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking. One app, over 300,000 experiences you'll remember. Do more with Viator. What do millions of Americans and four U.S. presidents have in common? They all get a better night's sleep in Bull & Branch sheets. They feel incredible because they don't cut any corners and believe that quality takes time. Bull & Branch sheets are made free from toxins with the finest 100% traceable organic cotton. They only use long staple threads, slow spun for an unmatched softness, and they'll feel unbelievably soft for years to come. Once you experience the quality of Bull & Branch, you'll never sleep in anything else. Shop their annual summer event now to get 20% off your order for a limited time only. Use promo code 
code WONDERY20 at BowlandBranch.com. That's 20% off with free shipping, free returns, and our 30-night worry-free guarantee. Shop now at BowlandBranch.com to start getting the best sleep of your life. That's B-O-L-L and Branch.com. Promo code WONDERY20. This is a bit of a non sequitur, but in the movie, there's a plot point involving a tattoo Mm. on the Morgan Freeman character. And that tattoo is also on your body in the same place on your right wrist. It says Amor Fati, A-M-O-R, Amor Fati, F-A-T-T-I? F-A-T-I. F-A-T-I. And that's Latin? What does it mean? It's Latin for loving your fate. It's something I've stumbled into, uh, you know, just in reading during the pandemic. It's, It's sort of a stoic ideology, but I forgot who it was done by. Somebody who's listening can Google the origins of it. But I, I folded it into the film because I thought it was it was helpful for me in dealing with my sadness and grief, the idea of embracing your fate and finding a way to love it because there's sort of power in, in just saying, I can't control this, so I'm going to find a way to love what I have, what I've been given. I don't know how to describe it other than that it felt empowering. And so I wrote it into a good person because Morgan Freeman's character has been through quite a lot in his whole life. And also, as our story goes, uh, he, in the last year, lost his daughter and, and son-in-law. So I, I like the idea of it being a little memento that he put on his wrist to help himself. And then when the film was wrapped and kind of to commemorate the experience and my own love of the expression, I put it in the same place that Morgan has it in the movie on <laughs> my own body. How scalable is the idea of loving your fate when, if you're like Morgan Freeman and fate has dealt you, not Morgan Freeman himself, but the character in the film had a very difficult and violent father. He served in what many believe to be a misbegotten war Mm. in in Vietnam. He struggled with alcoholism. He had a lot of family issues of his own making when he became a father. And then he lost his daughter. Is it fair to ask somebody to love that kind of fate? I don't know. I have, it's not me to judge if it's fair or not. I, I just think there are coping mechanisms, not unlike the things we're talking about, meditation, exercise, and the like. To me, it's akin to, to someone finding a prayer they like that's meaningful to them. Just inspirational words to live by, to aspire to. It's not for me to judge if it's possible or fair for anybody. As a secular man, I feel that I am looking for words of wisdom and prayers of sorts to live by. And this one's been helpful to me. So the way you compute it is something, I'm going to guess here, it's something along the lines of like, look, this is the way things are right now. I can rail against it or I can just love that this is my life the way it is right now because that is the sanest approach. Yes, and also what might come out of this that could never and would never have been. I mean, the film, just as an example, A Good Person is about two people that would never in a thousand years have had a friendship and would never have changed each other's lives or even probably been in each other's lives. Her uh, former fiancé is estranged from his father, so he probably wouldn't have been much in her life at all. But fate brought these two people together and they end up saving each other in a special, unique way that the film tells. One positive way when you when you dealt a round of grief or, or sadness or depression is to focus on positive things that have happened, gratitude for things you have in your life and things that you're lucky to have, things that you're blessed to have, and whatever your fate has dealt you, those things in the same hand of cards that it's dealt you the grief. I'm not saying I can always think that way, Dan, but I'm saying it's something to aspire to. Absolutely. That's why you get it tattooed on you. It's It's literally tattooed on my wrist so I can stare at it all day. (laughs) Absolutely. I'm a huge believer in that. I mean, there would be no point in me having this podcast since we say the same shit over and over again. There would be no point in having the podcast if we didn't need to hear it over and over again. One of the things I say a million times a year on this show, and almost because I need to hear it, is that the original translation of the word that we now translate as mindfulness, the original translation of the word sati, S-A-T-I, the ancient Indian subcontinental word, which we now describe as mindfulness, is remembering. (laughs) Because that is what we're doing in meditation. We're remembering to wake up and by tattooing a morfati on your on the inside of your wrist, you're remembering to practice it. That is the path of personal development, for lack of a better term, is to remembering to cut against our ingrained habit patterns, which are often making us miserable. And we need to re- be reminded all the time because life is so busy and we're distracted by so many things. So obviously meditation helps you quiet your mind and focus on what it's like to have a quiet mind, but also 
reading and learning and podcasts, all these things help us remember because we so quickly forget, yes. you know? Well, How many times have you read a great <clears throat> quote and you've seen the quote before, but then you read the new the quote and it's like you're experiencing it anew and you're like, totally. how did I fucking forget this totally. quote? This quote should be my mantra. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, what I like about meditation, because I am all for books and podcasts and that's how I make my living, but I'm all for it as a consumer too. But what meditation does, I think, is pound it into your neurons on the regular. And so it just gets into you in a deeper way than merely hearing something inspirational. I'm not a meditation fundamentalist. I'm a believer in all sorts of modalities. But the thing about meditation is that it's putting it into your molecules in a way that I think is really powerful. I believe it. And it's something you can use all day. I feel like when I do it regularly, you, you sort of built up a well that you can pull from for that day. Yes. That's my experience. Yes, it. 100%. I felt that with yoga too. For a while I was into uh, something I'd like to get back into, but a form of yoga that was quite meditative. And I felt like all day long, I remember it was, this was a time when I was living in New York City and I and I'm using the subway and feeling like the chaos of that, and that I could find myself going into the quiet space of the, mm -hmm. of the yoga and calling it up, like, like a stored battery that I had charged that morning. You know? One might even say remembering. Yeah. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Or this is what I'm stealing from the Buddha. You and apps like Headspace and the like, I think are making it palatable to so many people that wouldn't have access to it or the time to study the ancient Buddha or to go on a retreat somewhere. I think you're doing a great service by presenting it in a way that can be digested in the, in the modern world. Thank you. When we're talking about Amor Fati as the motto, it reminded me, maybe I'm making a connection where there is none there, but this is only my second year at TED, but I have a TED bud, this woman who you may have heard of. Her name is Maria Semple. She wrote a book called Where Did You Go, Burn a Debt, which got made into a movie. Anyway, I never heard of the movie or of the book or of Maria, but I got seated next to her at a dinner last year. and I absolutely fell in love with her. And so I was hanging out with her again last night. And I think she's amazing. She was a pioneering comedy writer, was working on shows like the SNL when there were no other female writers and just a really funny and cool and brave person. And she was telling me last night about a quote that she likes, which is learning to love your likes. Now, this was an expression that came around before Facebook. So it's not about getting positive feedback on social media. It's about the things that you do every day that you just like that you might overlook, like your morning coffee or taking a walk, or the fact that you live close to your favorite restaurant. All these little things that are cool in your life yeah. that you would otherwise overlook. Yeah. Remembering to fall in love with those. Yeah, I love that. I also do a thing every night while I'm trying to fall asleep and, and try and focus that time on the things that I'm grateful for in yes. my life. Yes. So I have a bit of insomnia that I, that I deal with. But one way to use that time lying on the pillow waiting to fall asleep is to, instead of obsessing about the next day or things that are on my to-do list, to focus that time on finding all the many things that I'm grateful for, both small things and the big things in my life. I do the exact same thing. I also have insomnia. What are your remedies for that? Oh, man, I'm, I'm throwing the kitchen sink at it. Um, hot baths every night mm. is new for me. Mm. Someone suggested that, and I really feel that that's helpful. Mm. There's this, you know, sleepy time tea. There's like extra mega sleepy time tea, and I drink that. No screens in the bedroom. That's a killer. So, I mean, my phone a bit, but not watching TV in bed. I'll do that maybe on the weekends, but on a normal weeknight, I get in bed and read because, you know, it's a whole regimen for me. This is new, and these are new things I'm trying. But taking a hot bath, drinking the tea, getting in bed with like one light on, putting the phone down. Sometimes I'll play digital backgammon and I'm on my phone. But other than that, my point is trying to get away from watching TV and movies in bed. A book makes me tired and helps me fall asleep. I would imagine for you watching TV and movies would be more stressful than it is for most of us because it is your work and you're going to be in work mode watching it. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I love movies and TV more than anything, but they stimulate me. They don't make me tired. Okay. A book, even an interesting book, I find will drain my my eyes and my mind and sort of be a good wind down, especially if you're sipping on sleepy time tea and yeah. just had a hot bath. It's a good <laughs> wind down. Whereas if I'm watching a show that's so good and so fascinating, my brain's not winding down. It's firing on all cylinders. Succession doesn't put you to sleep. Oh, God, I love, I love that show. I missed this week. so uh, Me too. But last week I thought was one of the best episodes of television I've ever seen. I know I'm not alone in this, but 
that show is so wonderfully written and so wonderfully acted and so wonderfully directed. And I've loved so much of it. But I thought that that wedding episode was one of the best dramatic episodes of TV, dramatic slash comedy episodes of TV I've seen in a long time. I agree. It was extraordinary. The tone is just so uniquely them. Yes. No one else is hitting that brilliant tone. I don't even know what to call it other than succession. <laughs> so for books, fiction or? Nonfiction. Nonfiction. Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, Mark Harris wrote a great book about Mike Nichols, which I really recommend to everyone listening. And the one I'm reading now is really amazing. and I don't want it to end. And it's called Pictures at a Revolution, Five Movies and the Birth of the New Hollywood. It's really good. He's a wonderful writer about Hollywood. I just read a book called The Chaos Machine that I highly recommend to everyone, especially if you have children, that's just about social media and the social media empires and what they're doing to our minds, especially what they're doing to our children's minds. And I don't even have kids, but you should read The Chaos Machine if you do. Um, Has it impacted the way you use absolutely. it? Absolutely. I'm in a different mode right now because I'm really plugging a good person in my film to anyone and everyone who'll, who'll listen. But when that period is over, I definitely will tiptoe back off of social media because I, I found it to be all-consuming and addictive. Addictive in that you're looking at what other people are posting, doom scrolling, or like looking at how many likes you got based on what you posted? Um, no, more just like setting the tone of my day with negativity. Mm. I really got off Twitter because I was very involved with reading Twitter and I just found the tone of it was so negative. I don't mean searching for stuff about me, although of course one sees that. I mean, just mean like the cynicism and anger of it. Um, Seth Godin uh, was another person who was on Rich Roll's podcast. He said uh, something that really stuck with me. He said, I have no interest in reading people day trade their emotions. <laughs> and that really kind of landed with me. You know how sometimes something just lands with you? And I thought, if this was a town, I wouldn't go to this town. Right. Why am I bringing this town into my home? <laughs> <laughs> it's totally true. It is. It really is. And they're not just day trading with their emotions. They're day trading with your emotions. Well, it just gets you riled up about any subject. And so I successfully stopped using it. I do go on, of course, because I'm lucky enough to have a lot of followers on there. I do. It is a great way still to get your word out about my projects. And I use all the social media, not TikTok personally. Because I, I, they tasted TikTok and was like, I do not need this addiction. But I go on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter to promote my stuff. But when I'm not in a promotion mode, I'll glance at Instagram a few times a day to see what's up with my friends and family and, and stuff. But I'm, I'm not on Twitter or Facebook anymore. Coming up, Zach talks about his latest film and why it feels like a return to probably his most famous film, Garden State, which was a huge success. Why both of us agree that writing can bring us to the lowest of low points and the highest of high points. And finally, Braff gives us a meditation pep talk. You can host the best backyard barbecue. When you find a professional on Angie to make your backyard the best around. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that. Wedding season is in full bloom. And if you've been wanting a straighter smile, look no further than Bite. Bite offers clear teeth aligners that help you transform your smile from the comfort of your home or wherever you'll be this time of year. Forget the endless trips to the dentist. Bite's clear aligners are doctor-directed and delivered straight to your doorstep. Just take an impression mold of your mouth, preview your 3D smile, and order your all-day or at-night aligners. Bite also knows that wedding season is expensive enough as it is. Their aligners cost thousands less than braces. It's time to let your smile shine. Get started on your smile journey by visiting Byte.com and use code WONDERY at checkout to get your at-home impression kit for only $14.95. That's B-Y-T-E dot com, code WONDERY, to get over 80% off your impression kit. 
couple of other questions for you just before I let you go. We've referenced Rich Roll a couple of times, who's been on this show and I've been on his show. I'm a big admirer. Yeah, of I'm his. like his publicist now. I, I don't know if Rich needs me as a publicist because he's blowing up, but um, I am his publicist. Well, you're representing a good <laughs> client. Just to come off of that Twitter conversation is what I said to Rich when I was on his podcast is you are the, for me, you're the antidote for the cynicism and the nihilism and the negativity of the internet because what you are broadcasting as a human being is positivity and light and growth and humility. And I just love everything that he's putting out there. And Rich was a, um, and I know there's other people who do this, but for me it was like, oh, there are corners of this internet where people are putting out rays of sunshine. Yes. And yes. I think I really gravitated towards him because he was doing that. He yeah. is doing that. He is doing that. One of the things you said on that interview was that Garden State, which came out 20 years ago, huge success, mm -hmm. but in some ways that kind of messed you up having that success. Why? I don't know that I, I didn't mean to say that it messed me up. I was certainly not expecting it to have the global reaction that it had. And it caught me a little bit flat-footed because, you know, I thought my parents and the temple choir would see it. I didn't think, <laughs> I didn't think everybody would see it. But it's amazing. And I have, I, I mean, I've been here at TED one day and I probably had half a dozen people come up to me and say that's one of their favorite films. So it's a gift that keeps on giving and it brings me a lot of, what's that Yiddish word? Nachas. Nachas. Yes. Nachas. yes. <laughs> uh, I think in some ways I was so wide-eyed. I always say I, I didn't know I didn't know. I was so new to it. And I don't know that I could ever repeat that success. It was lightning in a bottle, you know. This was my closest attempt at being as authentic as that wide-eyed young kid that wrote that movie was. A good person is, at least for myself, a return to trying to strip away some of the jadedness I experienced from learning about Hollywood and for better, for worse, for people who like what I make, getting back to something that was authentically vulnerable and raw. Do you ever have feelings of like, I'm never going to top that or I'm never going to do anything that's going to hit that hard? Well, yeah, I'll tell you something that's <clears throat> factual is the, the drama at the box office is sort of a dying organism. So I can probably predict that I won't make anything that will have a theatrical box office like that. I don't know. Of course, I could choose to make something that that does do theatrical business like that, and, and, and perhaps I will. Who knows which direction my life will go. But in terms of personal films, like A Good Person, like Garden State, I think we're witnessing the end of those as a theatrical experience. But I watched A Good Person on Amazon Prime. Yes. And very much enjoyed watching it at home. Yeah. Is that nails on a chalkboard for you no, as a filmmaker? No, no. One has to, listen, we have to, we have to evolve with the times. Uh, you know, it's, I think for people who love theaters, I love live theater as well. It's a passion of mine. My father got me into going to the theater in New York. That's how I learned to love movies. But, I, you know, I don't want to be a Luddite. I want to evolve with the times. And the times are saying that, it seems that COVID may have been the last few nails in the coffin for certain types of films at the box office. If you look at all those awards movies from last year, I mean, they're wonderful, wonderful films. But the Overton window has shifted to those types of films are consumed yes. at home now. Yes, the window has actually gotten tighter in that there are fewer and fewer types of films that do well in a theater. And they include usually men in tights. Well, you have action, horror, kids' movies certain sort of zeitgeisty, oh my God, you got to see this wacky comedy kind of things. Like the, there was the one about the killer doll, which, Megan. I, which yes. I really enjoyed. Yes. It was yes. hilarious. Yes. Um, I saw it at home, but it was a box office success because it was, I guess it's sort of horror, but it was also uh, a zeitgeisty meme kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know? But um, it's just rolling with the times, you know? I, I think it is what it is. If my research is correct, you're writing your next film now. You're doing some writing. I've started something, yeah. I've started something new, and it's in early stages, but I have a beginnings of something. I read that the writing process for you is pretty torturous, and you need to have accountability partners. <laughs> yeah. Can you walk me through that? I mean, I do know. I mean, small. don't you know that as a writer? Well, I mean, I hate writing. Um, right. But I am actually really stubborn and disciplined, so I will do it. I don't need accountability partners. I will do it, but I just hate it. Do you know any writers that love it? This is totally prejudiced, so I apologize if this describes you, what I'm about to say. But anytime somebody tells me they love writing, I feel like, oh, so you must be a bad writer. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. All I know is that I always think of the Lawrence Kasdan quote, being a writer is signing up to have homework for the rest of your life. Yes. <laughs> or what, what Philip Roth, when he was 84 and quit writing before he then died, he put up a sign on his computer that said, the long struggle is over. <laughs> I'm trying to be um, 
to be um, to write more. You know, I act, I direct, I write, I produce. I find writing to be by far the hardest thing for me. And that's mostly due to getting one's butt in the chair and just doing it. So I dread it a bit, but then I love having written. Yes, yes. It's amazing feeling to yeah. when you finish read, something. When you, when you finish something or when you read back something that you've created from scratch and you're proud of it and you send it to people that you respect and they say this is good work, it's the best feeling there is. Yes. So I agree it's like having homework for the rest of your life, but to muscle something into the world that did not previously exist and would not exist if you hadn't thought of it, it's an extraordinary thing. Absolutely. And also to then sit at a diner in New Jersey and watch Morgan Freeman across from Florence Pugh delivering the lines. Yeah. It's just it's just the <laughs> highest high in life. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. That's it, absolutely amazing. But you so even though you've had that high, you still need some sort of cattle prod to get your ass into the chair. I could never write a novel, but I, I imagine the people who have a successful novel go, oh my God, I got to start from the bottom of the mountain again. It's hard. It's just mindfuckery. And really, it's just battling your, your brain. But for some people like myself, that's hard. You're in good company or bad company. I don't know, but <laughs> I feel the same way. Is there something I should have asked you here, but failed to ask you? That's a good question. Do you always ask that? I ask it a lot because I'm insecure. That's a good question. Um, no, I just want to thank you, like I said, for, I, I don't know that all of your guests can say this truly and honestly, but I read your book before I knew your whole story. Um, I knew you was a journalist and I, I read your book and it really was impactful to me and introduced meditation in my life. I saw you as a kindred spirit because I know that you were battling anxiety and panic and I had battled that and it just felt like, gosh, if this could work for him. And I, and I didn't have a cocaine problem, thank God. But I thought if this could... It's never too late. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what are you doing tonight? Um, let's not drink. Let's not drink and do blow. Um, no, but I really found you as a kindred spirit. And um, and I want to thank you because you, I'm living proof that you made a difference in and continue to make a difference in people's lives. Thank you. This is an overused phrase, but that genuinely means a lot to me. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I was really... And still I am trying to talk to people who are left out of the discussion, you know, on these types of issues because usually it's our fault because I'm talking about men now or, or anybody who's a skeptic, whatever your gender, the way meditation or spirituality or contemplative practices or uh, often that conversation is held in terms that people like us are tempted to shut down. Yeah. And I really... We're doing ourselves a disservice by ignoring this stuff, and so I'm trying to just be a bridge. Well, you are a bridge, and I think it's helpful for people to hear that you can start with five minutes. To one minute. Or you can start with one minute. Absolutely. And also, don't think you're going to feel it necessarily. You might have a little bit of mind quiet, but like we were talking about the challenge, try 10 minutes every morning for a week, and I bet you'll feel it. I do. Like, if I fall off the wagon... And then I do 15 minutes every morning for five days. I do genuinely feel a greater sense of calm that week. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Congratulations. It's like a therapy session. Well, uh, you know. Thank you for watching the movie. My pleasure. I enjoyed yeah. it. And I recommend everybody watch that movie. Yeah, you can, good uh, person. you can rent it now anywhere you rent movies. It's called A Good Person. And remind everybody of the name of your podcast, Fake Doctors. Fake Doctors, Real Friends is a Scrubs rewatch podcast I do with my best friend, Donald Faison, who played Turk on the show. And we are almost done, sadly. We're running out of episodes, but we've watched almost every episode of Scrubs. And then we go on incredibly long, random tangents. It's really about our friendship and our sense of humor. But we do aspire to at least make it through, basically, going through an episode of the show, each episode of the podcast. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. You're free. <laughs> that was great <laughs> it was great thanks again to Zach love hanging out with that guy thank you as well to the good folks at TED as I mentioned we recorded this in person at the TED conference in Vancouver a few months ago check out TED's podcasts which include the TED Radio Hour and TED Talks Daily they also have two shows with my man Adam Grant one is called Rethinking and the other is called Work Life they've got a ton of shows go check them out Thanks to you for listening. Go give us a rating or a review. That really helps us. Also, as I mentioned at the top of the show, would love to know whether upping the cadence of episodes is a good thing or a bad thing or neither nor in your opinion. 
And thank you most of all to the awesome people who make this show. 10% Happier is produced by Gabrielle Zuckerman, Justine Davy, Lauren Smith, and Tara Anderson. DJ Kashmir is our senior producer. Marissa Schneiderman is our senior editor. And Kimmy Regler is our executive producer. Scoring and mixing by Peter Bonaventure over at Ultraviolet Audio. And we get our theme music from the great Nick Thorburn of one of my favorite bands, Islands. They have a new record coming out. You can already hear one of the songs if you want to go check that out wherever you listen to your music. We'll see you all on Monday for Sleep Week. We're doing a two-part series on sleep. The first episode is with my friend and former colleague, Diane Macedo, who wrote a whole book about her experiences dealing with insomnia, and it's just filled with actionable advice. Hey, hey, Prime members, you can listen to 10% Happier early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen early and ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, do us a solid and tell us all about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. Are you the biggest worrier in your family or your friend group? Are you the type of person who doom scrolls compulsively? Well, stop scrolling. Grab your weighted blanket and your headphones because uh, I might have a new podcast that could help. From Wondery, Don't Panic leans into our most absurd anxieties and diffuses them with humor and practical advice. Hosted by the anxious and overly informed comedian Anthony Atamanik, each week the show explores a worst case scenario. Like, what do you do if you encounter a bear or a swarm of killer bees? or you find yourself in quicksand. Each episode's Panic of the Week will make you laugh, learn, and possibly uh, sweat profusely. Follow Don't Panic wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Raising kids can be one of the greatest rewards of a parent's life. But come on, some days parenting is unbearable. I Love My Kid, But is a new parenting podcast from Wondery that shares a refreshingly honest and insightful take on parenting. Hosted by myself, Megan Gailey, Chris Garcia, and Kurt Braunohler, we will be your resident not-so-expert experts. Each week, we'll share a parenting story that'll have you laughing, nodding, and thinking, oh yeah, I have absolutely been there. We'll talk about what went right and wrong. What would we do differently? And the next time you step on yet another stray Lego in the middle of the night, you'll feel less alone. So if you'd like to laugh with us as we talk about the hardest job in the world, listen to I Love My Kid, but wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app.